Live from New York, it's your Yu-Gi-Oh! News, news Gio, with your host, Davinator1212. Good evening, welcome to News Gio. I'm your host, Davinator1212, and these are tonight's top stories. August was another big month for competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, both the physical and mobile versions of the game. Both the physical and mobile versions had their Worlds Tournament over in Berlin, Germany, as well as over here in the United States we had our UDS. With the results and analysis of these tournaments coming in, as well as being on the tails of a format-defining ban list last month, it seems that the format will be shaping up very nicely moving forward. Also, this month we'll be seeing the release of the Golden Sarcophagus Megatins. These tins were surprising due to some interesting promos, as well as an apparent departure from the more classic Mega Tin format. Be sure to tune in later in the broadcast as our special guest goes over these said tins. And finally, to end tonight's newscast, we'll be looking towards the future to see what these tournaments and tins have for us in store. All this and more on tonight's News Geo. First and foremost, tonight's biggest top story would have to be the World's Tournament over in Berlin, Germany. Competitors from all over the world gathered in Berlin to test their Yugi might in the land of Bratwurst, Beer, and Walls. The character duel between Yugi and Seto, Dan Green, and the other dude definitely set the stage for a very nostalgic feel at this World Tournament. Both in the Dragon Duels and main events, Salamangrate had an excellent showing, with both finals being mirror matches between the deck itself. The Salad World for the main event, Shai Xing Wang vs. Koki Kosaka, ended up being an interesting 2-0 sweep, despite the fact that Koki managed to open very heavy on his tacked-in mind controls. This ended up being a blessing in disguise, as those spell cards came in handy later in the match. A slightly anticlimactic end of the tournament, Koki managed to brush over... Wang pretty effortlessly. All the while, Jerome watched. Envious. He's a man who appreciates a good <laughs> brush aside. However, I believe the biggest winner of the tournament has to definitely be Dan Green, doing his best, um, Solomon Moto impression. Damn. Tem's looking like Santa. However, Worlds was not an exhibition of just the physical game, but also the mobile game Duel Links. Here to give you his expert play-by-play -play of the Duel Links Worlds Finals is our in-house Duel Links expert, Ty Wolf Jason. You go, Jason. Attention, duelists. There's a new 2019 Duel Links champion, and my head resembles Phil Barrier. Welcome, Duel fans. It's your boy, Ty Wolf. Welcome back to another edition of the Duel Links Corner. In this segment, we're going to talk about the Duel Links World Championship match, the new addition to the Limit 2 list, as well as the new set to drop in August. So let's jump right in. Let's start off with the differences between the regular and the Duel Links tournament. For those of you who don't know, the Duel Links matches in the World Tournament is a nine-round Swiss top four cut best three out of five deck style tournament. You have to play five different decks, three standard and two legendary, and the limit one, two restriction applies to each deck, but they cannot duplicate it in any other deck across the board. Our two finalists are Shuhei Kobayashi and last year's champion, Takahiro Hamada. Round one was a standard match with Kobayashi playing six samurai and Hamada playing triamids. With the absolute perfect opening hand, Kobayashi started off playing like he wrote the Six Samurai playbook, ending his turn with the legendary Six Samurai Shien, Kaizen, and Anishi, along with two face downs. That board present left Hamada with no choice but to forfeit his first turn, ergo losing the first round. Round two was the legendary match, with both players using Electromagnetic Warrior. Kobayashi lead it off again. He ended his board with Electromagnetic Warrior's Gamma and Alpha. During his opponent's battle phase, he then triggered both monster effects, summoning two deltas, adopting two more magnet warriors to the graveyard, setting himself up for his next following turn. As soon as turn three came around, he stampeded forward with Berserkion and decimated his opponent. Round three was the last standard match. Kobayashi playing full metal Desperado, but Hamada was playing the Six Samurai. This match had a bit more back and forth, but it was Kobayashi who stood up by capitalizing on Sartoria's skill, first using Time Wizard to completely wipe out his board, and then using 
cup of ace in order to gain better hand advantage. The game ended with Kobayashi flipped the little engine that could and then summoned the BM4 Black Spider. He activated Black Spider's effect, destroyed Anishi and his little train in order to summon Desperado Barrel Dragon from his hand, not only inflicting 850 points of damage, but pretty much forcing his opponent to forfeit the match. When I first saw this, I thought two things. One, Kobayashi swept Hamada on the rug like he was trying to avoid an ass whooping from his mama. Second, I didn't know that boy was into BDSM because he completely dominated him, okay? It's like the boy forgot a safety word. Safety word was a 10. In other news, there is a new addition to the Limit 2 list. The legendary Six Samurai Anishi is now in the elite club of, you're getting too good, you need to take a step back. Anyone who's ever played this card know it's a great interrupt, and its performance in Worlds pretty much had to solidify why it was placed on the Limit 2 list. Lastly, we're going to talk about the new set that dropped in August, The Curse of the Dread. This mini set contains a nearly supernatural amount of zombie support, ranging from Ven Dreads, Glow Up Boom, Red Eyes Necro Zombie Dragon, and even brought us the best zombie tuner ever, Aspred a Zombie. They also sprinkled in a couple of fables and venom monsters, but they're not really all that important. But my venoms! <laughs> <laughs> well, that about wraps things up for me. Once again, it's your boy Ty Wolf. Back to you, Dave. Thank you, Jason. That was that was very informative. What? No racial windows or anything? I have no idea what you're talking about. You people are so sensitive. You got one more time before I snap back on you like a rubber band. Uh, anyway, moving on. Before our special guest tonight helps us analyze the Gold Sark Megatons... Our field reporter Tommy has pre-recorded a segment that he's been wanting to do for a while to help all of you Yu-Gi-Oh! players get the proper nutrition and make sure that you are ready and fueled for your next major tournament. This is Yu-Gi Foods with Tommy. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. Well, welcome, guys. Today uh, on our show, what we are doing is we are making an olden recipe from our very own Davinator 1212's Graminator 1212. Uh, this recipe was a recipe that she made back in the olden days of the Great Depression, and it's a nice, cheap eat that you can go ahead and make on the fly with little to no experience, as well as a little to no money. That way you can spend all the rest of your money on shiny cardboard. We are uh, taking on the recipe of a cold hot dog pie. Other than that, let's get into the ingredients. So what you'll need for this recipe is one package of unflavored gelatin, two sticks of butter, a bowl full of weenies, a couple of hot cherry peppers, some pickle chips, about two tablespoons of Italian seasoning, half a tablespoon, of black pepper, half of a large onion diced up, three hot dog buns, some hot sauce, mayonnaise, ketchup, and mustard. All right guys, so to start off, what you're gonna do is you're going to take your wieners, boil them. You're gonna take this and put this into a small saucepan, turn on that heat. What you're gonna do with this butter is you're going to saute your onions in it, making them nice and translucent. All right, so now that the butter's melted and the hot dogs are done, we get started on the next step. First, we're going to take these hot dogs. We're going to drain out most of the water. You want to keep some of the hot dog juice to really get that all-natural, all-beef frank flavor up in here. Now, you want the onions to saute on a medium-low flame, like I said before, just so that they can get nice and translucent. All right, and the next step now is uh, to create your crust. So you're going to use your buns and the other stick that you have of the unsalted butter. All right, so you have your buns all set up. You're going to take your stick of butter and you're just going to work it in there. Got to make sure you show these buns some spots. Form the buns to the bottom of your pie pan. So you're going to continually mush bun butter until it is one cohesive crust. So we're going to throw this in the oven like this at about 350 for maybe about a good 5 to 10 minutes. We'll see how it goes. We're going to play this by ear. You know that it didn't call for a stick of butter, right? That's disgusting! Why do you have me making this shit? You know I know how to actually cook, right? This is gross! I bought hot cherry peppers, but you can do sweet cherry peppers if you don't like the spice. But you know, we're Yu-Gi-Oh players, we like the spice. And you're gonna turn the flame off, you're just gonna stir these around in the residual heat that is left. Basically cut the weenies in half as I add them into the fluid processor. I hate you, Dave. 
Alright, so you have your hot dogs in there and then you take your hot dog flavored water. That way it's all blended together nice and evenly. I'm going to add your Italian seasoning and your black pepper. And to this delicious mixture, you're going to add your pack of unflavored gelatin. We're going to put this on a smoothie. Okay, so we're going to check on our slurry. Uh, meanwhile, we have our pie crust going, and uh, as soon as that finishes baking up a bit, we'll come back to show you the rest of this hot mess. Alright guys, so our buttery crust is finished baking. We've kept it in there for about 10 minutes after the oven fully preheated to 350. So, I'm going to go ahead and slide this puppy out of here. It actually smells really good, surprisingly. Just like so. We're going to dress it with some pickles. Now we're going to chill it for about an hour. After chilled, we will add our sauce. In the meantime, I'm going to show you guys how to make a wonderfully delicious spicy mayo that's nice and simple for this pie. Mmm, yum. It's far better. So now you go ahead and chill this in the refrigerator. So now we're going to make the spicy mayo. We're going to take a nice heaping spoonful of Hellman's real mayonnaise. All right, so I'm taking Frank's Red Hot because we put this shit on everything. Once you get 10 squirts out of her, you go whip up your spicy mayo. Okay, and then you're gonna chill this as well. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna dress her up. And we've got our good old spicy mayo that we made before, some well-shaken ketchup, some well-shaken mustard, and we're going to do as follows. Spread the wonderful, delicious, mayo mixture on there. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and just drizzle on some goldens like so. And ta-da! There you go. There is the wonderful cold hot dog pie. You're supposed to do the skit straight face, Thomas. Shut up, Dave. Just be happy I did the damn skit. It's coming. It's wiggling. It's <laughs> jiggling. It's not coming the fuck out. <laughs> Um, lo and behold, Grandma never fails. Thank you, Graminator1212. This is us signing off. Yeah, right. The, the texture haunts my dreams. But, uh, anyway, the gold sarcophagus tins have certainly turned the tin format upside down. Instead of just being reprints at the same rarities with choice cards from different sets during the year, there seems to be an inclusion of bonus sets as well as rarity bumps in these tins, which led us to believe that these are definitely going to be a bit different than Mega Tins of years past. Not only that, but the promos included in the tins are extremely newsworthy and definitely worth a closer analytical look. Live from the Hoenn region, fresh off his top four UDS run, we bring you our Mega Tin promo expert and expert in why nobody plays things, DZeef. Welcome, Doug. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to meet a Pokemon. But let's cut to the chase. It is my opinion that Nibiru, the primal being, will not see any play in the upcoming format. Do you agree? What are you even talking about? The Primal Bean is a fantastic card. It can drastically punish your opponent for even overextending one tiny summon. Not to mention that the token is gigantic, so you can even cheese some wins with Borosaur Dragon. It's ridiculous. What am I talking about? What are you talking about? I fail to see how a Pokemon is qualified to talk anything about Yu-Gi-Oh! A Pokemon who is at the very least more qualified than you. I guess you're right. See, I told you. But anyway, I gotta go. I have a bunch of bad comments to sift through. Hopefully I find some good ones about pot agreed. Oh well. DZ's not even in Sword and Shield, so I didn't really need it anyway. But in order to finish the segment, I need to heal up Ryan here. Oh. Yeah, that's the last time I'm sticking up for you. Come on, you know I was right. No, Dave. Doug was completely in the right. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, I know. I was just trying to argue with him to get some of that good, uh, you know, YouTube beef clicks. Can I just do my part so I can leave? Absolutely. Go for it, buddy. Thank you. So tell me, Ryan, do you believe Salaman Great's impressive showing at Worlds will see it get another hit on the ban list, a lot like previous Worlds winners have done in the past? Or do you feel that the hit in July, plus its lackluster showing at the UDS here in the TCG, will make its win at Worlds a moot point? So as far as the Salaman Great hit on the previous ban list and then winning Worlds, um, I think that the previous hit's actually going to be all they're going to get. I don't think they're going to be uh, hit again after winning Worlds since the Worlds list was kind of a fake list between the TCG and OCG. I think Gazelle was at 1, but Circle was at 3, so the deck was still pretty consistent. Uh, if you look at the current, uh, the, the two most recent events uh, of tournaments, got the Pro Play Games uh, and the UDS Invitational. Both of those had very strong showings from Thunder Dragons. Thunder Dragons were the only one that was not really hit that hard. I guess you could say the Danger, uh, Thane Danger Thunder Dragon variant was got a little bit of a love tap because of the semi limits to the dangers. However. Uh, it was clearly not enough because that was definitely highly represented and in fact I think won both events. So that is what we have to look forward to going forward. I do not think the Salmon Greats will get another hit. Uh, I think Thunder Dragon is going to be the deck to look out for. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you Ryan for blessing us with your words of wisdom. Alright, I gotta go adult now. You have fun with your your silly news show and uh, talking about a children's card game, Dave. Uh, I don't know why I still do this for you. And that was your August edition of News Geo. Please join us at the end of September for the next edition as we go over just exactly what happened once we got our hands on those shiny gold tins. I have been Davinator1222, and, two, and this has been NewsGeo. Thank you for joining us, and good night. Wait just a moment. I can see you were about to click the subscribe button. Was I right? Tell me I was right. I was right, right? My Millennium Eye lets me see everything, including these other videos by Davy Boy. Don't be a stranger. You will always be welcome in my Toon World.